Greetings and welcome to New Covenant Church. My name is Chris Costaldo. I serve as lead pastor. New Covenant is dedicated to seeing Christ preached, love extended, and lives transformed by the power of the gospel. This is the first week of our 10.30 a.m. semi-masked service. Um, You're welcome to keep your mask on if you prefer. Uh, The approach that we're taking, uh, as you probably know, is to uh, arrive masked, sing masked, and depart masked, but otherwise you are once again free to remove your mask if you like. Um, We continue our missions theme this month, and today we have a resource I'd like to draw your attention to. It's a brochure showcasing all of our missionaries, our our, uh, partners who are serving around the world. And uh, this is a, a great tool to use when you're gathering with family, over breakfast or dinner, whatever is your custom, to, uh, to consider God's word, to sing songs. Uh, you can uh, use this in order to uh, talk about our missionaries and lift them before the throne of grace. So please be sure to uh, leave with one of those. Well, it says in John's gospel that the light shines into the darkness. The darkness does not comprehend it. But John goes on to say that as many as received him, Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. As we begin our worship this morning, we want to bring honor and glory to our risen Christ. And so in that light, let's stand together as we sing, All Hail, the Power of Jesus' Name. Oh. 
as you remain standing, we'd like to uh, affirm the Apostles' Creed this morning as we continue our worship together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let's join our hearts in prayer, shall we? Our Father, we address you as Lord, the Holy One of Israel, who called Abraham and Sarah from Ur, and who calls us from the nations. We confess that we're not as close to you as we wish, and we know it's not because you have moved, but because we so often wander. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. We confess we have found this way hard and wearisome. Our feet are tired of wandering. Our hearts are sick of being lost. Too often we feel like the meandering of those lost in a desert, afraid that we've moved beyond the shepherd's reach. But then we hear the Savior's call, the Son who died, who was raised from the dead. According to this grace, Father, would you receive us, your prodigal children, prodigal because we've wandered in a far country, prodigal in our forgetfulness of you, prodigal for the blessings we've taken for granted. Now, with our hearts bowed, we silently acknowledge these sins to you. By the shed blood of Jesus, we return to you, Father, knowing that you are even now running to meet us, covering us with the robe of your redemptive grace, placing upon our hands the ring of your forgiveness, offering a kiss of limitless love, divine love which loved us while we were yet sinners. We pray now for those in particular need, especially for dear Gracie and the Canfield family. Would you please be their refuge and strength, their peace which surpasses understanding. And for our nation, in this tense, fragmented moment, we pray, amid bitter acrimony, especially as we approach the election, would you impart wisdom to our leaders, enable us to navigate the complexities of this moment in a way that bears witness to Christ's character. And finally, we pray for the ministry of your word this morning, that you would enable me to express your mind and heart, proclaiming those things you want us to hear. All of this we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our New Testament scripture reading this morning is Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 23. Acts chapter 10, reading verses 1 through 23. I invite you to please stand for the reading of God's word and to remain standing for the doxology. 
Now hear the word of the Lord. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to his house, and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. January of 49 BC, when a Roman general from the region of Gaul paused at the banks of the Rubicon River. The Roman Senate had strictly ordered him to disband his army and return to Rome at once. He was explicitly told to not take his soldiers across the Rubicon, which designated the northern boundary of Italy. There he stood at the river bank, pondering his future, the prospect of imperial glory set before him. The name of this general was Julius. We know him as Julius Caesar. Would he obey or would he proceed across the Rubicon? According to some, Julius is said to have stepped forward 
and uttered the phrase, Elia Yakta Est, the die is cast. And with that, his army followed him across the shallow river. Since that time, the expression crossing the Rubicon has described an action that is irrevocable, the point of no return. This morning's sermon, you might say, is about the Christian Rubicon, the decisive moment in which the Apostle Peter steps forward to change history forever. The amount of attention Luke devotes to this event is a testimony to its significance. The next six chapters, Acts 10 through 15, illustrate its importance. By the time chapter 15 concludes, the message of salvation is liberated from the fetters of an ethnic religion as a universal faith belonging to every tribe, people, and nation. It's the gift that God promised long ago to Abraham, Genesis 12. In you, Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. We've seen hints of this promise in the Psalms, Psalm 87, for example. Among those who know me, says the Lord, I mention Rahab and Babylon. This is in addition to Mount Zion. Behold, Philistia and Tyre and Cush. In other words, our text showcases God's heart for the nations, for every person in the world. Luke makes it clear that this was always God's desire. For the gospel writer frames his, uh, his work with this promise. Think of the beginning of Luke's gospel, the pronouncement of Simeon, Luke 2.32. And then at the very end, Jesus' commissioning of his disciples to go forth and preach this good news to all of the nations. And it's further underscored Jesus' ascension when our Lord reiterates how his expanding kingdom will unfold, first in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and indeed eventually to the remotest parts of the earth. Now you may be wondering, if this was God's desire and goal from the beginning, why did it come with so much difficulty? The answer is simple. Prejudice. Prejudice. Sadly, it's natural for those who have privilege to see it not as a gift to be used in service of others, but as a mark of superiority that leads to one's own entitlement. This kind of privilege feeds our ego creating an impassable gulf between the insider and the outsider. So it was for much of Israel. Compounding the problem was Israel's identity as a set-apart people, her calling to avoid assimilation by maintaining purity in what she ate and how she dressed and in a host of ceremonial regulations. We can only imagine how intensely difficult it must have been for the nation to suddenly shift gears and open the door to outsiders, to people who have no interest in her conventions. As we continue our study of the book of Acts, we find in Peter an example of such transformation, a movement across the Rubicon that God intends for all of his people. We begin by noting how God laid the groundwork for this transformation. First, there was the example of Jesus. Jesus' life and teaching illustrated the humble, welcoming posture of God. God with his arms stretched out to the world. The inner circle of apostles included an array of figures, a tax collector, a zealot, a fisherman. It was in many ways an example of social diversity, at least in that day and age. But the truth is, one can experience the best of examples and still harbor unhealthy prejudice. Then there was Philip's example. In Acts chapter 8, we see Philip going to Samaria, where he boldly proclaims the gospel. He then sits in the chariot of an Ethiopian eunuch, whom he leads to Christ and then baptizes. Philip demonstrates the centrifugal movement, the outward movement beyond familiar cultural boundaries. It's this example that Peter then follows as he launches out to encourage the saints along the coastal plain. We noted the miracles of Ennius, 
Tabitha. Just a few weeks ago, we saw in the healing of Ennius the paralytic and the raising of Tabitha from the dead, Peter becomes the channel through which God extends his hand of healing, the enlivening grace of the Spirit. This impartation had nothing to do with visiting the temple in Jerusalem or Mosaic rituals. It was simply a work of the Spirit in Jesus' name. As Paul would later write, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. And then there was Peter's lodging in Joppa. Peter's dwelling place on the coast beside the open sea promoted a new perspective on all the peoples that God was calling. Let us not forget, it was this harbor to which Jonah had come years earlier, fleeing the presence of God when the Lord had commanded the prophet to go to Nineveh. Would Peter make the same mistake? We shall see. Then there's Peter's new roommate, Simon the Tanner, whose occupation as a leather worker surfaced many of the religious tensions surrounding the identity of God's people. Well, finally, we're introduced to Cornelius, the consummate outsider. He lives in Caesarea, the Roman capital of the province of Judea, a beautiful location some 30 miles north of Joppa on the Mediterranean coast. The city had only recently been constructed and beautified by Herod the Great. Herod spared no expense in fulfilling his vision of creating a major international port that rivaled Alexandria. He created the first artificial harbor of the ancient world, a feat over which engineers marvel to this day. About the splendor of Caesarea, one commentator writes, Herod patterned the city itself on the style of a Roman provincial capital with all the amenities, including temples, theater, market, hippodrome, and amphitheater. The beautiful 4,000-seat theater was located at the south end of the city with the seats facing the Mediterranean. Archaeologists estimate that the seating capacity around the oval track of the hippodrome was 30,000. Imagine that. Luke, however, is uninterested in the glory of Caesarea. I was at this location just over a year ago, and I remember sitting there in that oval track area looking out upon the Mediterranean, and as the, the archaeologist was lecturing, I could almost you know, imagine, envision all of these magnificent buildings surrounding us. And yet then it occurred to me that in hindsight of history, none of that really mattered. I mean, it mattered, but, but not in the same way as the apostle who would eventually walk northward with the message of Christ. That's Luke's concern. The movement of a humble fisherman named Peter who bears a crucial message for a man named Cornelius, a message that would change the world. So who was Cornelius? We begin reading in verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. Luke turns our gaze to something far greater than the splendor of Herod's seaport. He, he directs us to a divine bridge that God is about to span between his people, the saints, and the Gentile world. For this climactic event, God has called a certain Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian regiment, I like him already, which meant that 100 soldiers operated under his command. Luke's description of Cornelius' character suggests that God had been pre preparing the soil of his heart for some time. He's a God-fearer, that is, one who worships Israel's God and supports the Jewish community. Like Tabitha in the previous chapter, his reverential spirit was a memorial to the mercy and grace of God. What made him so remarkable, this Cornelius? Well, it grew out of his prayer life, verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, as he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? 
You said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now, send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. The reliable sign of Cornelius' devotion to God is his prayer, his prayer life. What is prayer? It's simply stepping into the light of God's presence. That's what it is. Because it's there that we encounter the holiness of God. It's interesting, in the two volumes written by Luke, there's seven instances when prayer sets the stage for some kind of life-transforming divine encounter. In this first look at the Roman commander, Luke describes him as praying during one of three traditional times of prayer. It's at three o'clock. A prayer that coincided with the afternoon offering at the temple in Jerusalem. In this context, we might think of David's words in Psalm 141. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, David writes, and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Picture it as the smoke ascends toward heaven from the altar in Jerusalem's temple Cornelius' eyes are open to recognize an angel standing right there before him in glorious array. At once, the angel approaches and calls his name, Cornelius! Struck with terror, he exclaims, What is it, Lord? The angel allays his concern by assuring him that his prayers and acts of devotion have been pleasing in God's sight. That's how it works. Um, the Lord appears to us in his gracious and merciful character, and he sends his servants to do that. Then came the instruction, Cornelius is to send messengers to Joppa to summon a certain Simon called Peter, who is lodging by the sea with another Simon, a tanner. The messengers are told where to go, but they have no idea why they are going which is simply God's way of helping them to walk by faith and not by sight. Isn't that true? Psalm 119, 105 says that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's not a headlight shining off into the distance to illumine what's going to happen in the coming weeks and months and years. No, it's one step at a time. Well, next we're given a glimpse of Cornelius' home life, verse 7. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. After the angel's departure, Cornelius summons two of his servants, a soldier and another uh, two particular servants. Having explained all, so there's three in total. Having explained all that the angel told him, Cornelius dispatches these three messengers to Joppa, which is 30 miles to the south. Luke's focus then returns to Peter, verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey, approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, He fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened in something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. Luke brings us to Joppa at noon, that's the the sixth hour, and it's the next day. The messengers are approaching the city, but God must first prepare Peter. He's not yet ready, see. Of their arrival. So God does this work in Peter's heart. See, a Gentile God fearer such as Cornelius would have had no objection to eating with a Jew, but a devout Jew would never cross the threshold into a Gentile home, and much less would he ever consider table fellowship. Jesus' example and teaching may have softened parts of Peter's prejudice. But it will take special revelation for the apostle to traverse this Rubicon. That revelation arrives in the nick of time. Peter goes outside Simon's house and climbs the stairs leading to the roof to enjoy some undisturbed 
prayer. That's how it was in those days. The roofs were often flat. You had access on the outside, external staircase, and there you can enjoy the, the breeze coming from the Mediterranean. So Peter does. From the rooftop, he beholds a panorama of the sea shimmering in the noonday sun with a variety of sailboats gliding through the crystal water, white sheets unfurled. While praying, Peter is suddenly overcome with hunger. Perhaps distracted from prayer, he requests a noonday meal. While Simon's servants are preparing it, suddenly a trance comes over him. Now, Cornelius had a vision, right, a horama. Peter falls into a trance. Ecstasis is the Greek word. The term literally means to stand outside of oneself. So he's having this out-of-body experience, and he looks up, and like Stephen, he sees directly into heaven. He sees a large sail or a sheet lowered from the sky by its four corners, and it contains every sort of animal, clean and unclean. According to the dietary laws of the Torah, Leviticus 11 in particular, there were four basic criteria that applied that distinguished clean and unclean animals. Here they are. First, land animals had to both chew the cud and have a split hoof. Second, sea creatures had to have fins and scales, so no sort of slimy things that swim through the, the water. Third, winged insects had to have jointed legs to hop. And fourth, birds of prey, reptiles, and other crawlers were entirely off limits. Among the animals the Israelites could not eat were camels, rabbits, pigs, eagles, and lizards. But Peter now sees many of these prohibited creatures laid out before him on a sheet presumably mingled with animals that belonged to the Jewish menu, a grand smorgasbord to satisfy his hunger. Then comes the divine command, verse 13. There came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill, literally sacrifice and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and then the thing was taken up to heaven. As Peter stands mesmerized by this ecstatic vision, he is further shaken by what he hears. The divine voice commands him to rise, sacrifice, and eat. Given the context of Peter's hunger and the unexpected nature of the command, this voice may very well have sounded like the voice of the devil instead of God. Remember, of course, Jesus in, in Matthew 9, when he is hungry, it's the devil who comes to him and instructs him to make bread out of stones. So Peter is processing this. The suggestion to, to eat unclean food would have revolted a devout Jew such as Peter. He, he simply doesn't have a category for this. The double negatives by no means never make his refusal emphatic and uncompromising, for he has never consumed anything common or unclean. Peter is now standing at the foot of the Rubicon. The divine voice reiterates the command a second time and then a third time, each concluding with the emphatic announcement, what God has made clean, do not call common. It raises the question, what was the purpose of the Jewish dietary laws in the first place? There are many ways to answer the question. All of them relate in some way to the purity that God intends for his people a purity that would one day be fulfilled in the coming Messiah. The prophets anticipated a time when God would cleanse those who worshipped him in spirit and in truth. The new covenant promise of Ezekiel expected a time when God would cleanse his people from all of their impurity. I will sprinkle clean water on you and will cl cleanse you. I will cleanse you from your impurities and your idols, says the Lord. Well, Peter is about to realize the fulfillment of this long-anticipated promise of God. That brings us to the arrival 
of the outsiders, verse 17. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood outside the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. The ecstatic vision ends, and Peter remains alone on the roof, pondering its significance. Just then, Cornelius' messengers arrive at the gate. The timing is perfect, especially when you consider that it took 30 miles for them to reach their destination from Caesarea. After they entered the city, they had to locate the harbor and then find someone who could give them directions to Simon's house. The variables are endless. Nevertheless, they arrive right on time. This, my friends, is how God operates. We may be dazed and confused. We may look around and wonder what God is up to, but he is up to something, and his timing is always perfect. He is fulfilling his will in and through his people. And that leads to the orders from the commander, verse 19. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. The three messengers are outside And they're calling to Peter with a loud voice, loud enough to be heard over the hustle and bustle of Joppa. Remember, this is a time before doorbells. As those inside the house hear the call, the Spirit engages Peter's mind and rouses him to action. Peter, who had heard Jesus' commands many times before, gets the message. He must follow them without hesitation, ensured or assured that this is the will of God. With the Rubicon before him, Peter begins to walk. This is the climactic moment we're approaching. Verse 21, And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? Peter arose, descended the outside stairway, and stood before the messengers. The apostolic insider was no longer in his elevated place. He was down on equal footing with three outsiders. And I moved by the next sentence. It says, I am the one you were looking for. I can think of no better picture that portrays the essence of ministry, what you and I are called to as God's people. It's not creative marketing or clever strategies or cultural influence that constitute the church's call. At its core, ministry is about responding to God's invitation to walk by faith across the bridge, embodying and proclaiming the hope of Christ. Peter takes this step. He approaches the visitors, embracing his role as a listener to hear and understand why they have come and how he can serve them. My friends, please take note of this. When we step forward as active listeners, hearing the needs and the concerns of others, we are halfway across the Rubicon. And that leads us to Peter's invitation, verse 22. And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. The messenger's speech is carefully constructed, illustrating how well Cornelius had prepared them. They explain that they are sent by a Roman centurion whose devotion to God is acclaimed by everyone in the Jewish community. They also highlight that their mission was divinely orchestrated by an angel who had appeared. Finally, the outsiders are invited inside, verse 23a. So he, Peter, invited them in to be his guests. By the time the meal arrived, there were three more guests at the table. Within reach, just over the figs and the hummus and the cucumbers, were Gentile faces 
like the three wise men, representatives of the Gentile nations. While eating, Peter is perhaps hearing the echo of Jesus' words. What God has made clean, Peter, do not call common. The apostle has crossed the bridge. Well, that leads us to the question then, how about us? The hero of our story is the triune God. It's his providential hand that actively works behind the the scenes every step of the way. The Lord superintends the finest of details to orchestrate the event. Two angelic visions, the divine voice, hunger pangs, the precise timing of the messenger's arrival after a 30-mile journey to coincide perfectly with the conclusion of Peter's vision, the Spirit's voice, and then finally the meeting itself. In all of Scripture, there are very few passages that showcase the sovereign hand of God quite like this passage does. No, Peter does not go the way of Jonah, but rather like Isaiah of old, he presents himself to the Lord and he says, here am I, send me. He demonstrates for us what it looks like to be an instrument in the hand of God. Two takeaways then, both in the form of questions. How is God calling us to step out in faith? As we pray about our calling in this moment of history, what is God leading you to do? Whom is God calling you to approach with the hope of Christ? And then secondly, as we think about those people, are we prepared to embody and to express the good news of Jesus in ways that connect with their needs? As we look across the street at our neighbors, as we think about our coworkers, or perhaps those we see at the grocery store, are we praying, Lord, open my eyes to see the Rubicon that is before me. Show me the bridge so that I might move forward and help this person understand what it means to walk in the light as a child of God. Oh, my friends, in this moment of history that is filled with such bitter acrimony, this is the outlook that God's people need to have. Well, finally, how should we conclude a sermon like this? Well, the words of Bob Dylan seem apropos. In the penultimate stanza of his song titled, Crossing the Rubicon, he writes this. I feel the Holy Spirit inside and see the light that freedom gives. I believe it's within the reach of every man who lives. Keep as far away as possible its darkest for the dawn. I turned the key and broke it off, and I crossed the Rubicon. My friends, have you turned the key, broken it off, and crossed the Rubicon? Let us pray. Father, thank you for this great event. The Apostle Peter stepping forward as your servant in ways that defied everything with which he was familiar, and yet he did it by faith, in ways that were deeply challenging, required a great deal of sacrifice. Help us as your people today to find that same faith and to apply it in such a way that brings the good news of Jesus into the lives of those who need it. Toward that end, we give you ourselves in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we respond to God's word with the singing of our hymn, Christians, join in celebration. Please stand together. Right.
Let us receive the benediction. God's people, in this day of growing shadows, let us remember the example of Jonah, and let us remember the example of Peter. And may we move forward saying in our hearts, here am I, O Lord, send me. Amen. You may be seated.